It was an important chapter in South Africa's legal and apartheid history. A prominent anti-apartheid advocate stepped up and became the only lawyer to represent three Nobel Peace Prize winners, Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Chief Albert Latuli. Welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. My guest today is Thomas Grant, a practicing barrister and author who lives in Sussex and in London. We're here to talk about his book, The Mandela Brief, Sidney Kentridge and the Trials of Apartheid. Thomas, thanks so much for coming in and chatting to us. Thanks for having me, Jill. Oh. So let's start. Um, we get to know uh, Sidney Kentridge through the book in his discussions uh, as it uh, happens in court. Um, how did this unfold? And the question is really, who was he? What made him tick? Sidney Kentridge, who I should say is celebrating his 100th birthday in November 2022, so in, in a couple of weeks' time, was born in Johannesburg in 1922 uh, to a uh, well-known pro and prominent pol politician of the time uh, called Maurice Kentridge, who was at the time a member of the Labour Party and then moved to the United Party. And he was brought up in Johannesburg, uh, went to King Edward School, um, and he then fought in the war, spent many years uh, as a member of the South African Air Force in, in Italy and in Europe, and then came back and became an advocate in 1949. He, um, so he, he qualified relatively late because A, the, the war years took off, a lot of y took off a lot of time, and he then went to Oxford and studied jurisprudence, having studied previously at, at uh, Witts University. Um, so he qualified as an advocate just after the 1948 uh, election and um, was thrust as a member of a very small bar in Johannesburg at the time. I think there were only about 100 or 110 advocates practicing. He was thrust into the center of all the litigation, all the legal issues that were thrown up by the legislation passed by the National uh, Party government from 1949, 1948 onwards. Um, and he very quickly became a, an advocate who specialized in uh, what you might describe nowadays as human rights litigation, did a lot of criminal law, represented a lot of people on murder charges in his very early uh, career. And his first great case, um, and the case that made his name, I suppose, was the so-called treason trial, which was a huge uh, trial, lasted, I mean, the, the legal proceedings lasted five years. The trial itself lasted three years. It was an attempt by the government to effectively snuff out uh, uh, anti-apartheid opposition, anti-government opposition, and the most prominent of the defendants, uh, the accused in that, in that trial, was Nelson Mandela, hence the name, uh, or hence one of the reasons for the Mandela Brief as a title to this book, and he was a very prominent figure, of course, Nelson Mandela at the time, and he spent three years on trial effectively for his life in the old synagogue in Pretoria, which was a, a, court, a courthouse at the time, and Sidney Kentridge, amongst many other very prominent advocates, defended him, and that made his name, uh, and he thereafter became, Sidney, a very prominent anti-apartheid advocate, amongst many other things. I mean, he did a lot of other things as well, but the, the, the book is very much focused on those trials, from the treason trial, onwards up to some of the cases he did in the 1980s. That's the, that's the core of the book. Mm -hmm. So an activist, in a sense, well, and an advocate. Uh, let, me, let me just mm -hmm. say something about that. There are, we all know about advocates, uh, lawyers, who are activist lawyers, for whom law is an adjunct to their political program. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. The Sidney Kentridge, although he was a member of the Liberal Party in the 50s and 60s, and of course that's the party that was um, headed or co-headed by Alan Patton, um, he never saw himself as a political lawyer in the sense that he was not using the courts to further a political perspective. He was using the courts to uphold concepts of justice, con uphold concepts of the rule of law, uh, and doing it very effectively. And it was always his view that you are a much better lawyer and you're much better able to give proper representation to your clients by being a punctilious lawyer in court and never using the courtroom as a, as a platform for making slogans or making political speeches. And he never, so he never made political speeches. And I think his clients, and you've mentioned three of them, and, and Winnie Mandela was another client he represented uh, her on a number on a number of occasions and other many other 
well-known anti-apartheid activists, all, I think, appreciated the fact that he never used the courtroom for sloganizing. He was always there intent on one thing, which is representing his clients to the best of his ability, so as to ensure that they did not uh, hang, and many of the cases he was doing were capital cases, and where the death penalty was a real risk, and, and secondly, that they got the lowest sentence possible, and if possible, that they were acquitted. And in many of the cases that I discuss, uh, although one would think that the odds were very much stacked against the accused, uh, they were acquitted. And, and one of the things I, liked, I, I, dis I discuss in the book is the, the, what I describe as the schizophrenic nature of South African justice at the time. It wasn't like a police state like mm. Nazi Germany or Soviet, Soviet uh, Russia. You could get a fair trial. It was difficult, but you could get a fair trial. And a lot of the judges pr uh, who were sitting in the 60s and 70s were men, and they typically were men, who had a conception of the rule of law and were not there simply to do the bidding of the government. Of course, some of them were placemen, others were not. You could potentially achieve acquittals, and Sidney Kentridge achieved many famous acquittals in mm -hmm. his time mm -hmm. representing people like Nelson Mandela. So you would say fairness then was, was something really, really important to him across <coughs> all, all areas of life? He's a, he's a you know, the, the rule of law, Justice runs through him like a slogan in a stick of rock, to use a, to use a, uh, an, Engli an, English, an English metaphor. Um, absolutely, he's a, a man absolutely committed to, uh, to, to, to a, 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 a proud and noble conception of justice, and as a result became in South Africa the, the most, or if not the most, one of the most famous advocates at the South African bar, even yeah, when he was in his 50s in the 1970s, I think it's fair to say by the 1970s he probably was the most uh, well-known and, and well-regarded advocate in South Africa. And he then moved gradually to London and started practicing in London and became remarkably in his 60s, mm -hmm. the mo and I can say this as an English uh, uh, advocate based in London, became the most famous advocate in London as well remarkable to achieve that in two separate countries. Amazing, yeah. So uh, would you say that, um, that he was very calm and collected in all of his cases, or did he ever lose his temper? Sydney's general demeanour is one of precision, is one of uh, considering everything he says. He, he never says a word which he hasn't thought about before saying it. Uh, his advocacy was, you know, there's, there are many accounts, eyewitness accounts of his advocacy from the 1950s through to the present day. Um, and so one can pick, piece together a sense of the man in court. And precision, carefulness are, were his hallmarks. But also, and I've read many of the transcripts of the trials he did, the famous trials he did in this country back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So I have a sense of, although I wasn't there sadly, I have a sense of, of how he advocated. But, there were, but through the calm and the precision, there, were, there would be flashes of anger and flashes of irony and flashes of wit, which could completely change the atmosphere of, of the courtroom. So he wasn't in any way, you know, he, he got angry in court and sometimes anger carries with it a great forensic heft as an advocate. But, but to be angry all the time, you lose your court. But to allow in anger, but, and carefully modulated anger at a given moment, can be forensically and rhetorically much more effective. So that's a, a general flavour of, I suppose, Sydney in the courtroom, <laughs> Sydney Kentridge in the courtroom. And what do you think it was like sitting in the witness uh, chair and being cross-examined by? Kendrick? Well, I've, I've, um, one of his most famous cross-examinations, which was in the treason trial, the case I, I mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago, and that was a, a trial, as I say, of started off with 156 accused, and it was gradually whittled down. Uh, but some of the most famous, the most famous figures at the time of the of the anti-apartheid movement, and one of the or the one of the, the key propositions of the prosecution was that they were all party to an overall conspiracy to overthrow the state by violence. And it was said that that must be so because 
it was said that Mandela and his co-accused were communists and that the communist doctrine that they espoused necessarily had as its core the concept of overthrow of the state by violence, overthrow of the, of the status quo by violence. And they called a, a, a philosophy professor from Cape Town University, a man called Murray, who put in a report and was giving evidence about communist doctrine and saying these, these pamphlets are communistical, the Freedom Charter is communistical. And Murray was cross-examined by Kentridge and by uh, uh, another famous advocate called Izzy Meisels for 30 days. It was a 30-day cross-examination, and uh, half of it was taken up by Sidney Kentridge's cross-examination. He took over from Meisels. And one of the things he did very effectively, and to some extent rather amusingly, was to put to Murray anonymous... Uh, uh, statements by uh, statements of, of political doctrine and say, well, I'm going to read something to you, Professor. Tell me, do you say this is communistical? So he'd read it out and the professor would say, absolutely, that is definitively communistical. And then he would say, well, do you know who, that, do you know who I was quoting? No, that was Voltaire or that was Woodrow Wilson or that was, that was Abraham Lincoln. And then finally, he puts another quote to Professor Murray and says, well, do you, without giving it an attribution, of course, says, do you say that's communistical? Absolutely. Can I tell you who it's by? Please do. Yourself, Professor. <laughs> you wrote that seven years ago. And it, it's, a, it's a marvellous cross-examination to read. It still, it still lives on the page. Um, and, and the Professor, was, um, who was like the key, the linchpin witness for the prosecution, emerged uh, a, a sorry wreck. Um, but I mean, his, his other most famous cross-examination were in the Biko inquest of, 19, of late 1977, um, which, of course, is a very, f a very famous and infamous event in this country where some of the most famous, cr famous words were spoken in a courtroom by Kentridge when he was cross-examining the various p uh, police officers and, and, and uh, police doctors who had had contact with Steve Biko in the last few days of his life. And certainly, I think, some of the cross-examinations he did uh, in that inquest have gone down in, in history as some of the most important moments in a South African courtroom. Um, thank you so much for coming in and chatting. It's thank absolutely you, fascinating. Um, so uh, my guest today um, was Thomas Grant, the author of the book Mandela Brief, Sidney Kentridge and the Trials of Apartheid. And thank you for watching. It is a really fascinating read and I can recommend it highly.